Okay, so we've talked about you know, how to think about the, like, all the activities that go to a machine learning project. And we've talked about how to prioritize projects. And then the next thing I want to talk about is um, you know, what are the different archetypes of machine learning projects? Like, can we say anything about um, what different machine learning projects look like? And you know, what are the implications of being in one archetype or another? Um, so I think the main archetypes that I think of are um, you know, one, improving an existing process. And a couple of examples of this would be, let's say that we already have an IDE um, and we're doing some code completion. But we want to use machine learning to, um, to do better code completion. Right? So we have a working system, we have an existing process, and we're trying to make it better. Um, building a customized recommendation system. Right now, maybe we make recommendations for our users just based on you know, sort of grouping them into um, high-level kind of archetypes or categories. Um, but we want to actually move to making very customized recommendations based on the specifics of their behavior. So we have something that's working, and we want to improve its accuracy. Or you know, build, building better video game AI. Right? So like most video game AI, AI right now is um, created just using um, sort of hand-tuned rules. Um, but maybe if we built a reinforcement learning system, we could do better. Um, another category is augmenting a manual process. Right? So um, taking something that people do now and then making it faster or easier for them to do it. So turning sketches into slides. Right? So you know, maybe um, right now we, our team makes a lot of slides and we want to build a system that will allow them to sketch it and then have it automatically get 80% of the way there. Um, email auto-completion, right? So people are still making the decision about what email to send, but we're giving them suggestions that they might use. Um, helping a radiologist do their job faster, right? So um, you know, again, if we're not aiming to replace the radiologist, just augment them, then, um, then a lot of machine learning problems or projects will fit into that category. And then the last category is automating manual processes. And so this is things like full self-driving, you know, fully automated customer support, or you know, fully automated design, like trying to create website designs from scratch. And so I think there's, um, there's a few sort of main questions. You know, if, once you decide kind of which of these categories your project is in, there's a few questions you want to ask yourself um, that might help you um, increase the likelihood of success of the projects. So if you're improving an existing process, um, I think one thing that, um, that people often get wrong is you, know, you should be really careful to assess that your models are truly improving performance on the downstream metrics that you care about. Right? And so this is about like, having really good instrumentation of your models and deploying things in production um, in a principled way so that you can tell if they're actually driving downstream behavior. Uh, then I think I would also ask yourself, you know, does that improvement correspond to business value? Right? So if we're making people click more often on recommendations that we give them, does that actually matter for our business? And you know, if so, then that's great. And if not, then maybe we should ask like, whether this project is really worth doing at all. Um, and then lastly, do performance improvements, so if our model gets better, does that lead to a data flywheel? And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second. If you're in the category of augmenting a manual process, then um, I think sort of the main question I would ask is, how good does this system really need in order to be useful? Um, and how can you collect enough data to really make it that good? Um, right? Because I think the, the difference between these two categories is that if you're augmenting a manual process, then you don't necessarily have a sort of data collection process that's built in for you. And then finally, for automating a manual process, um, you know, again, what's an acceptable failure rate for the system? And then how can you guarantee that it won't exceed that failure rate? Um, so I think this is, this is sort of one of the really hard questions when it comes to like full automation machine learning projects, right? which is like, let's say that we have a self-driving car and we have a training set and a validation set for that car, and we achieve 99.999% you know, accuracy on the validation set. Right? Um, how do we know that that really corresponds to uh, the failure rate that we care about in the real world? So how can we guarantee that we've 
um, that our data set is comprehensive of everything that we'll see in the real world that we would need to be able to solve in order to um, hit that, that desired failure rate. And then I think the, the last question that I would ask here is how inexpensively can you label data from that system, right? So if you um, are building an automated system where um, it's just gonna make predictions and those predictions are gonna be right or wrong, but there's no automated way of telling whether they're right or wrong, then improving that system is gonna be very difficult because you're gonna to need to go back and sort of manually collect and label data, right? So, you know, again, in the case of a self-driving car, right, if that car is just driving on the road with no human su uh, supervision whatsoever and it makes a mistake, then you wanna be very careful that you're able to collect the data from that mistake so that you're able to improve your system based on that. Okay, so zooming in on this, this question of performance improvements leading to a data flywheel. Um, the concept of a data flywheel is um, you, ideally in a machine learning project, you wanna be in a setting where um, as you collect more data um, on the right, then that allows you to build a better model, which then allows you to get more users and collect more data. Um, and so there, there are places where the, this can break down between each of these steps. So um, more users generating more data, um, this comes down to you know, have you built a, um, a data loop? Like have you built a pipeline that allows you to automatically collect data and ideally automatically label data from your users? Um, more data leading to better models. Um, this is really your job as a machine learning practitioner. So this one I'm gonna leave up to you. Um, and then better model leading to more users. So you know, the question here is, if our model's making better predictions, does that actually make our product better? Okay, so um, I think that each of these different sort of project archetypes lives at a different place on the um, impact versus fe feasibility trade-off, right? So um, the, generally the most feasible projects are where you're improving an existing um, process. But often those projects have the lowest impact. Um, but one thing that you can do to like sort of improve the impact potential of these projects is if you have a data loop that automatically allows you to improve, like continually improve your performance on this task and hopefully collect more data that will allow you to automate more tasks down the road, um, then these projects can become higher impact. Um, augmenting a manual process, I think sort of the key here to making these projects more feasible is good product design. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But I think the other thing that you can do here is like the other sort of important thing to do here is um, try to release a good enough version as soon as possible so that you can start, um, that, so that you can move kind of from, uh, from trying to augment a manual process from scratch to improving an existing process, right? So once you have something in production, then, you're, then you move down to that other category. Um, I think, you know, product design, good product design is like very underrated in machine learning. Um, so some examples that I like of this are, you know, Facebook automatically suggesting a tag, but asking me if I want to tag myself or not. So they get a label from that. Um, uh, I like this, um, this Grammarly tool that sort of automatically suggests grammatical changes, but it does it in a way that's, you know, it's not automated. It's a way that like where the product design makes this helpful for you, even if um, it's sometimes wrong. And then um, Netflix's recommendation systems, where it, um, uh, it tells you often like why it's making those recommendations for you. And so it, um, it allows you to sort of provide feedback that make the, makes the recommendations better. Okay, and then lastly here, um, you can move, you can take up a, a project that's automating a manual process and you can make this easier by somehow adding humans in the loop. Um, or limiting the scope of the projects and adding guardrails. And so I think most of the self-driving car companies are taking you know, one of those two strategies. Either they're, they have humans in the loop, so human drivers that are providing feedback to intermediate versions of the system, or guardrails, like they only are gonna operate within a certain area. Um, and so I think those are, those are the ways to make these projects more feasible. Okay, um, maybe I'll take one or two questions. 
Um, so I think an interesting question is, we, we, like machine learning is usually used for things that we already do. Uh, can you think, or yeah, we use machine learning to do things better than we can otherwise. Can you, are there examples of applications of machine learning where we can now do something that we couldn't do at all previously? And this uh, is posed as a question to all organizers. Hmm. So uh, I asked a question. Hmm. The context in my mind is that, as you mentioned in the project archetype, we only really consider machine learning for projects where, or for, for yeah, projects where there's already a manual process. All three of your, your archetypes are based on a manual process. Do you have examples, or does anyone in the room have examples where we might have thought outside of that realm and said, we couldn't do something before without machine learning, but now we actually can. I'm really interested in those uh, examples or, or applications, because I don't know of any personally. Hmm. So I love this question. Um, so I think when we think about supervised learning, you're essentially by design almost in that realm, but not necessarily. So here, are, here here's one example. So when the initial self-driving car challenge was held by DARPA back in 2005, 2006, essentially um, there was a notion that LiDAR was more reliable than camera systems. So you had an expensive sensor versus a cheaper sensor, but then LiDAR couldn't, couldn't see far out. And so some of the self-labeling they did was essentially keep track geom geometrically where your car has been driving. And then you can backtrack later and say, now that I'm here, I know this is road, not road. I can trace back and I can label my images after the fact based on high precision measurements I got later that I can trace back to where they came from. And so that's an example of, well, maybe or maybe not humans could have done the labeling. It's an example of a slightly different paradigm where very expensive, high quality sensing could then be used to label cheaper sensing. So that's one that comes to mind. It might be more generally applicable where you can use expensive sensors for labeling and even sensors that humans cannot do. So in my mind, that's actually kind of another archetype of projects that maybe Josh didn't mention, almost like a fourth type where maybe we, we do something now, um, we're not necessarily collecting labeled data or labeling data, but if we kind of change the framework of the problem, we might be able to label the data and kind of improve the process of machine learning. Mm -hmm. And then another one, um, maybe so, somewhat related, but a little different this um, kind of, actually Josh gave this phrasing to me, um, which essentially, one way to think of reinforcement learning, it's, it's about specifying what you want as opposed to how you need to get it done. And so in reinforcement learning, you think of it as, okay, you never need to know how to do it. You just need to be able to specify what it is that means success. And then the system's supposed to figure it out. And so it's a very different kind of learning. Of course, it makes the learning a lot harder because you don't get the same kind of signal about how to do things because you're excluding that. Um, but so reinforcement learning problems somewhat fall in the category that you're alluding to also. Cool. Yeah, I think much? yeah, I think one other thing that came to mind is um, things where we where the data that you're using to train the machine learning system is not interpretable to, to people. Um, and so I, I think of like um, you know fraud detection type applications or um, you know a lot of kind of what Palantir cites as their um, positive impact, which is like um, you know looking at a big data set and trying to find um, you know terrorists. And um, so I think those are things where you know, the, the scale of the data is just so massive that, and it's um, so uninterpretable that humans can't do it by themselves. But maybe if you train a machine the right way, it can do something like that. The closest example I had, kind of bouncing off what you're saying, is insider threat detection. So a lot of companies want to know, like, is someone going to leak data or, or compromise data yeah. or maybe you know, do something in that, that nature. And we don't necessarily, as humans, know how to do that. But we're starting to learn how to teach computers to, to recognize that. Mm -hmm. I okay. Think another yeah. another example is generating videos, like generative applications of machine learning. Yeah. Are now doing things that we couldn't previously do, like replicate people's voices. You know, make entirely new videos. Mm -hmm. So 